My name is Isabella Ferreira and I'm an advocate at the TARS Foundation. And this video today is about microservices and the TARS framework. So we're going to make a series of videos to talk and to explain more about the TARS framework. And this is the first one of them. So let's get started. First of all, what is TARS? So TARS is an open source microservice framework that was created in 2008 by Tencent and it is currently under the TARS Foundation. Uh, before we talk more about TARS, I'll explain a little bit about microservices and why microservices is a very hot topic nowadays. So experts predict that by 2022, 90% of all applications will be deployed using microservices. And this is due to the fact that applications are growing nowadays and they have the need for scalability. And because of that, companies and developers will start moving away from locally hosted applications uh, into the cloud. And this will actually help businesses to minimize downtime, optimize resources and reduce infrastructure and maintenance costs. But what are microservices? So microservice is an architectural pattern in which the application is based on many small interconnected services. And according to follower, uh, microservices are actually uh, following the single responsibility principle, which means that uh, uh, features that follow the same concept, they should be together in the same microservices and features with different concepts, they should be split split into different microservices and uh, those type of architectures they are actually extended to loosely coupled services that can be de developed deployed and maintained independently so this gives more flexibility to development teams um, so as I, I just mentioned with microservices we develop a single application as a suite, a suite of small services and each one of them running its own processes and communicating with light lightweight mechanisms such as the HTTP resource or any API. And this is the bare minimum of centralized management of those services because they can be developed in many different programming languages and they can also use, for example, different data storage technologies. So microservices are often compared to monolithic architectures. And so here I'm going to explain the difference of those two types of architecture and why people are using microservices nowadays. So first monolithic architectures, they are, uh, it means that the software is self-contained and that is that the components of the program, they are interconnected and interdependent rather than loosely coupled. So each component is associated with other components and they must be presented in order uh, and they must be presented in order for the code to be executed or compiled. And if any of those components are updated, then the whole application needs to be updated as well. And that's a big problem that usually gives a lot of problems for developers. Instead, in microservices, each module is independent and they can be changed without affecting other parts of the program. And this reduces the risk that a change made to one component will actually affect other components. And breaking down the architecture and the complexity of the program into smaller tasks made it very easy for maintenance, uh, makes the solution more scalable and uh, teams can work independently. So here we have uh, an image that explains how monolithic architectures were deployed and how microservices are deployed nowadays. So as you can see, uh, we have a user interface for the microservice architecture and for each specific part of those inter the, that interface, we have a microservices that is connected to a different database. So this gives teams the flexibility to develop each one of those microservices with a different programming language, accessing different types of database, and the team has the freedom to choose whatever they prefer. So many industries have actually changed to microservices. The first one was Netflix, that they, in 2007, 
they started the company and in 2008 as they they go they grow they grew uh, they experienced a major database corruption and in three days at that time they were working with dvds and they could not ship dvds to their members so they were suffering with scalability problems basically so in 2009 they decided to move to microservices and this helped them to achieve scalability issues service service outages and also reduce costs because when you uh, you put your application to the cloud that means that the cost is by streaming instead of data centers uh, another interesting example is actually uber so after launching Uber, they struggled a lot to develop new features and fix bugs and rap rapidly integrate new chains to their source code. So they decided to move to microservices and that provide them many benefits, such as uh, developers have a clear idea of ownership of their code because they know which service they were working on and that consequently boosted the speed and the quality of development. Uh, and microservices in that case also facilitated uh, fast scaling by allowing teams to focus on the services that they were working on and also updating virtual services without disrupting other services. Uh, also Amazon in 2001 they had uh, a lot of problems with the, their current architecture so they had development delays uh, challenges related to dev development and the services were all interconnected so they were also running into scalability problems and their user base was crazily growing so they changed to microservices and that allowed them to to make their scalability possible and nowadays they even have the microservices architecture which is amazon aws so those are just uh, some examples to show that companies nowadays are actually using microservices and how benefit that can have for an enterprise. So since nothing is easy, microservice also has uh, its problems and its challenges. So the first one is, for example, the difficulties of development also difficulties of service governance, uh, multi-programming languages. So if you want to develop many services in different programming languages, what should, should you do? Uh, pro problems with performance and concurrency, and also problems with the operational efficiency. So the solution to those problems is TARS. So TARS focuses on microservices and provides the solution to all the aforementioned problems. The first thing is that the developer can actually focus on the business logic. So TARS encapsulates different types of transmission and service governance of data. And this allows developers to actually focus on the business logic. And developers can use many protocols for communication, such as TARS protocol for interface description language. Uh, they can also use protocol codec and in interface oriented programming. Um, uh, with respect to the transmission, TARS enc encapsulates uh, different types of transmissions. So developers can work with TCP or UDP uh, and support different plugins. And with respect to the service governance, um, TARS already have all the service register and discovery implemented, as well as the load balance, overload protection, and distributed tracing. So this uh, makes it easier for developers since they don't need to develop with those features. Uh, TARS also allows developers and teams to work in different programming languages. So now TARS has different uh, five different programming languages. Those are Go, Java, PHP, Node.js, and C++. And uh, so basically teams can choose whichever language they prefer to work on. Uh, we also run some tests and we saw that TARS has a very high performance and high con concurrency architecture. So as you can see in this plot, we are comparing TARS uh, from different programming languages and with Spring Cloud and gRPC, which are also uh, two microservice framework 
and Tar C++ outperformed all the other uh, fr frameworks. TARS also provides support for DevOps. So if you're looking for continuous development, continuous integration, operational efficiency, and make release very fast, so TARS can help you. And it provides different uh, tools that you can use with, such as Jenkins, Travis CI, and GitLab. And TARS is currently also supporting emerging technologies. So if you're working with IoT technologies, deep learning, or edge computing, we have a layer in the TARS um, framework that's just for the development of those types of application. And we support different types of protocol, such as the TARS protocol, protocol buffers, user-defined protocol, so you can define your own protocol and also use multiple tools and uh, development libraries to develop uh, edge computing applications or deep learning applications. So it's really worth to take a look at that. And here is just a summary of what TARS is. So it's a microservice ecosystem and those are the layers and everything that TARS supports. So we have the infrastructure it can be either a server, a virtual machine, a container, or Kubernetes. Uh, many different languages. We provide support to DevOps. We already have many functions of service governance implemented, so developers just need to focus on the business logic. Uh, we have three dip different types of storage, which are cache, uh, database, and file systems. And you can also develop your applications, such as blockchain, deep learning and big data. So this is just an overview of what TARS is. And if you are interested on that, join our community. You can either access our website to know more about uh, the TARS Foundation and the TARS project, as well as the GitHub, the Twitter, and our official account on WeChat. And if you're more interested about microservices, we have a training course in the ETX platform. So you can just enroll, it's free, and you can learn more about microservices in general. And stay tuned for our next video, where we are gonna show how to deploy TARS with Docker. And this is, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is a series of videos that we teach you how to use TARS and we also deploy an application in the future. Thank you for watching. See you next video. Bye-bye.